And we're also going to go on Facebook Live. Why is that still there? Okay, I guess it just is. Whoops. Okay, so good. Um, okay. Okay, copy, good, and go live. Okay. Okay, good, so it's just booting up. If you're seeing us on Facebook Live, we're just getting set up for tonight's performance. And there it is, yay. And let's change this. Whoops. Start. There we go. And let's do this. Paste. Lovely. All right. And then let's do this. No, oh, that's not happening. Why not? Um, edit video. Oh, okay, that's not going to do it. Let's try this. Huh. So we need to go to the public, and it's not happening. Do, do you know how to make this public? Right. Public, thank you. Let's go back. Great. So sh we should now be live on Facebook Live. Good. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm John Fisher, and this is the Sassy Mouth production of Wild and Mom, which will perform tonight at 8.05 right here on Facebook Live and on Zoom. If you'd like to watch on Facebook Live, it's free. If you'd like to watch it on Zoom, it's free. If you want to watch it on Zoom, you can go to www.sassymouthpresents.com dot blogspot.com. That's S-A-S-S-Y-M-O-U-T-H-P-R-E-S-E-N-T-S -S -E -E dot blogspot.com. Spelled like it sounds. And it'll be wild, and wild tonight. Yay! But right now we're just going to do a technical setup to check some things out and make sure we're all ready for all of you. So first of all, echo. We're testing for echo, weird echoes. Also sync. It's our sound sync. And one more sound sync. Great. And let's do our Zoom feature. Yay! Ah, here I am in Zoom. Zoom on Zoom. And then loss of screen. Great. And good. And one more time. 
and great, good, good, good. And then a distant sound. So here we go. I'm now headed out onto Castro Street. Castro is a very famous neighborhood, as you all know. And here I am, I'm actually out on Castro Street. It is a lovely night outside. People out strolling, enjoying Castro Street. And I am now going back into the space. Yay! Yay, 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 yay. So that is our sound and stink and zoom and sound distance test. Great. So stay tuned. Uh, we're going to be setting up and talking. You'll hear our voices, but the show doesn't start until 8.05. Yay! Okay, good. So, Michael, um, just checking in, could you uh, hear everything? Was there any weird echo on Zoom? Okay, good. And was the clapping in sync? Yes, good. And you heard me when I went outside, um, uh, outside the room. You could still hear my voice and it was clear. Yes, very clear. Okay, good. So then on Facebook Live, um, was everything in sync? No weird echo on Facebook Live? Good. And you got my sound when I was outside. Great. Thank you, boy. I love you. Okay, great. Okay, great. And then let's make sure that that is on. Okay. Great. Okay, good. So Our usual thing. Oh. Oh, 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 oh. Did you lose something? Oh. Uh, I think it just is a delay. Yeah, that's uh, that's Facebook Live. This is the so is that yeah, good. Good, good, good. Lovely, thank you. Okay, good. All right. So All right. So this shouldn't, can't be too far this way. It should be more that way. So if you push this any distance this way, it should go back that way. Thank you. Lovely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank
Recording. Good, 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 good. All right. So, I have to remember to turn the lights off. What's that? Well, I think we can leave them on, but before we start. So I'm gonna wear a mask when the, if a guest arrives. Um, it's up to you. I, I don't want you. That's a that's a change. I don't want you to feel uncomfortable. So if you want to take it off when you when we actually start, that's also fine. Yeah, I'm just gonna have it on when they walk through the door. Yeah. So I'm hoping we're all right with power on the phone for this delay. I don't know how to check it. Okay. We've done this, this long delay and then gone into the show. Yeah. Okay. All right. Fine. All right. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you. All right. Okay, good, 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 good. It's public. It is public. Good. The computer host, public. Show it.
Okay. Okay. Could be good. Thank 
dentist. I have nothing to declare except my genius. Be yourself. Everyone else is taken. Always forgive your enemies. Nothing annoys the law. This is just everything. It's a temptation. When I was library. Then what were it? If you're not posing, then it's, it's, of course it's all patched. It's the truth. This is how everyone wanted it. It's good to see the great problem of Berlin, Napoleon. And this influenced Mom. He sought freedom to gain. He traveled obsessively with the plant. Oh, get to Paris. To speak frankly, I am not in favor of long engagements. They give people the opportunity of finding out each other's character before marriage, which I think is never advisable. Mom, 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 I do hope this is
Okay.
No, 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 no,
the audience. Okay, how are you? Okay. Well, thanks for being here. Yeah. Okay, good, 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 good. All right. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, we're going to be in shortly. If anybody needs to use the restroom, now would be a good time, of course. Uh, maybe uh, we might just have to start. Uh, yeah, I'll just go and let them in if they come. Yeah.
Okay, great. So, does anybody thanks? Does anybody need to uh, use the restroom still? We're good. Okay, great. Um, oh, it's just that I can do it. Yeah, it's tricky. No, it's okay. No, it's good. It's all good. Let's see. Oh. Okay, good. So we will begin shortly. Let me make sure this is all set. Help yourself. Yeah, I'll, I'll get this. Okay. All right. So we'll begin in just a minute.
Okay, is everybody bathroomed? Yes, good. And we're on Facebook Live and we're recording. Great, thank you, lovely. Okay, I'm standing by. Tell me if we need to reset something. Do we need to reset something? Are we recording? And it says that on the main. Good, and we're on Facebook Live. Thank you, yay. Yay! Here we are! Yay! And this is Wild and Mom. I'm John Fisher, and welcome to our studio audience. Yay! I invited one person. He showed up, so we're sold out. Yay! And everybody at home, thank you for joining us. Now, a few rules. As always, you have to help me out with the show, okay? And you help me out with the show by making sounds. That's right, right? So let's try out some sounds. We're gonna let our studio audience inspire you, right? Right? Yes, he's gonna inspire us tonight. So we're gonna begin with a boat whistle. Boop! Yes, that's what, wait, again. Yeah, yeah, now at home, everybody at home. Yep, yep, oh, oh, yeah, it could be a little louder at home. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we got a great at home audience. I love you guys. Now let's try a submarine sound. Yay! Yay! Good, good studio audience. And at home? Yeah, yeah, that's good. Oh my God, I'm hearing like an underwater echo, almost like a whale. That's great. Great, great subtlety at home. Thank you. Okay, so now the show begins. And here we go with Wild and Mom. Yay! This is pre show music you're hearing. Very suspenseful. When I was nine years old, my best friend was Alan Zulch. Oh my God, we had the best time. What we loved to do was spy. We were total spies all the time. We'd run around our town spying on everybody. What we loved most, though, was shortcuts. We loved shortcuts. Anything that cut from one street to another or one house to another, we'd race across it. So I want you to help me out with some music while I find some shortcuts in this town, okay? So give me the... Um, the Mission Impossible theme, okay? Bum, 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 that's good, that's good, that's good, that's good, keep it up. The other thing we loved was going up on top of houses 
We got to climb on top of anything and spy on people. Bum, 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 And then we can see everything from up here. Yay! We're masters of the world. This is the perfect thing to stand on because a lot of the houses in my town were full of wine and winas, rich winas. We love to spy, it was so much fun. And we weren't subtle about it either. Another thing that we loved to do was run through people's backyards. We'd come up behind their houses, run across their backyard, then run alongside their house and across their front yard, total trespassing, it was great. So I'm gonna run through somebody's backyard and you're the homeowner. And what I want you to do is when I run by, I want you to say, hey, hey, you kids. Hey, every time I run by, hey, hey, you kids. Let's hear it. Hey, hey, you kids. Hey, yes, hey, good. Hey, okay. Okay, great. Here I go. Here I go. Whenever you see me. And. <laughs> wow. We were so obnoxious. And of course, my parents owned a house, so I knew how obnoxious it was because my mommy was very protective of her property. She didn't want anybody walking on our property. And we were right next to this huge mountain. People used to go hiking on the mountain and then they'd come down from the mountain, sometimes accidentally into our property. And she didn't like that at all. And they'd be totally innocent looking people. Like not like anybody dangerous. They looked like me, like totally boring. Like they had like backpacks and hats and hiking boots. I mean, harmless people with canteens, super square. And my mother would go out there and go, excuse me, uh, excuse me, yeah, hi. Um, this is private property, where are you going? Uh, you're hiking? Oh, how nice. But this isn't part of the trail. Yeah, no, this is private property. Yeah, no, you can't. No, I'm sorry, no, please don't. Why don't you turn around and go back to the top of the mountain? Yeah, and then go down a proper public trail. Yeah, thanks, now turn around, yeah, bye-bye, bye-bye. Thank you so much for stopping by. Bye. Bye. Oh my God. And we didn't care though. We love to violate people's property. So this time, when I run across, I want you to say, dumbass kids, dumbass kids, rehearse with them. Dumbass, kid. dumbass kids. Yeah, okay, here we go. And, ah! <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing we got to do was German voices, right? The German high command, the spy masters. He was a German. Ah, I love it! Yay! Yay, yay, yay! I love all. Oh my God! Oh, you're a spy master. Alan used to say to me, is your German a little loud for a spy? I didn't care. I just wanted to do German. And my older brother, he was such a pill. You know, he was always like making fun of us. My older brother, he was like, you guys are so stupid. He had that thing. It was like a sinus thing. It was like he was always going like, and leaving snot all over his hand. You guys are so stupid. Fortunately, my little brother, he hated him even more. His name was Dave, and my older brother would look at him and go, dumb Dave. My father hated that. He hated it. My father was always saying, hey, hey, don't talk to your brothers that way. My goodness, what's your problem? You're supposed to be a role model. Do you realize that? A role model. Yeah, where's my cigarettes? Hmm. Can I find anything in this damn house? Where's my lighter? Is there any booze in this gym? A role model, do you understand me? My brother. He'd just look at my dad and say, you're all idiots. That was his gesture. So dismissive. Ah! And I guess, I guess the real thing that I loved about spies was, maybe I didn't even realize it, is they were hiding. They were hiding from things, right? It was like, there was a confluence, a connection between being a spy and being gay. I didn't even know I was gay yet, but a lot of the greatest spies of all time have been gay. Right? Like uh, that great art historian, Anthony Blunt, was a spy, a Russian spy in Britain. They didn't find him out for 40 years. And Guy Burgess, who worked with him, they didn't figure him out for 30 years. And then my favorite, my favorite, and a lot of people don't even know this, W. Somerset Mom, one of the greatest novelists of all time. He was a spy. He was actually a spy. 
He wrote books, he wrote plays. But during World War II, actually, he started World War I in 1914, the first war, he signed up to be a spy. He volunteered. Now, at the beginning of the war, uh, he'd gone to medical school. So the thing was, is he volunteered to be a doctor and he drove an ambulance in France. And that's where he met the love of his life, Gerald Haxton. Gerald Haxton was with the American Ambulance Corps. He came from San Francisco. He was a really cool guy. And they hit it off immediately. They became lovers. Unfortunately, Gerald Haxton, he was on leave in London and he was in a Piccadilly hotel, right? And the police broke in when he was mm, 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 in flagrante delecto with another guy. Illegal, right? Right? Violations, violations against nature, gross indecencies. Well, they couldn't do anything to him because, you know, essentially he was an American soldier. They didn't want to like prosecute him. So they deported him. They threw him out of the country. Well, that meant that Somerset mom couldn't see him. He's in love with him. He's heartbroken. He went back to England. He needed something to take his mind off of everything, something that would immerse him in, in the war, something more complete than the ambulance corps. So he went to the intelligence service, the British intelligence service, and he volunteered. And he was perfect for being a spy because, well, because he had a disability. Now, here's the thing. He is, as many of you know, the author of some incredible novels. He wrote The Razor's Edge, which is the ultimate book about self-discovery, about finding yourself at seven years old. He wrote a book that was essentially about hippies, a spiritual quest. And he wrote um, uh, The Moon and Sixpence, the best book about the obsessiveness of being a painter. And he wrote, oh my God, he wrote Of Human Bondage, that great book about sexual obsession with the best title ever. It's not the best title, I love that title, Of Human Bondage. It's so kinky. And it was all about this guy who was an outsider. He wasn't accepted by society because he had a club foot. He had a disability. And this girl who worked in a cafe, he was in love with her. He was obsessed with her. And she was so mean to him. She was just a mean old cockney. All she said was nasty things to him, but he loved her. He couldn't get over it. And this was in many ways mom's autobiography because he was an outsider too. He was gay and he had a terrible stammer. Whenever he spoke, he stammered. One weird thing is, except when he read his own short stories. If you listen to recordings of his own short stories, he doesn't stammer, it's amazing. But every other thing, his interviews, whenever you see him talk, he has a terrible stammer. So he had to hide, he had to withdraw. And that's why being a spy was perfect because it made him a great novelist as well because he listened, he became an expert at listening because he didn't want to hear people, he didn't want people to hear him stammer. So he just listened to people and that was perfect for spying. They sent him to Geneva. And he became in charge of sending all the spies into Germany and France, bringing back information. He did so well at this, but he went back to London and they gave him the choice assignment, probably the most important assignment of the war up to that time. He was supposed to go to Russia and keep the Russians in the war. Now, in World War I, the British had four major allies. The French, the Italians, the Romanians, and the Russians. The French were wavering. The Italians were wavering. The Romanians were wavering. And the Russians, the biggest ally, were wavering. They'd thrown out the czar. They blamed him for the First World War and they'd thrown him out. And now the communists were coming. If the communists came into power, Russia would drop out of the war and then Germany would be able to turn all of its armies against Great Britain. So they sent W. Somerset Maugham to Russia to keep the Russians in the war. I was dispatched to talk to the head of the Russian provisional government. His name was General Kerensky. I must go there and find out what it would be to keep him in the war. What would keep Russia fighting on the side of Great Britain? I was sent around the long way around the world. They thought it was safest, but it wasn't. It was full of peril. I was sent across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, give me some storm sounds. <laughs> <laughs> Then I was sent by train across the United States. Train sounds, train sounds. Then I was sent by another steamer across the Pacific. More, more uh, ocean sounds. 
I was terrified because my lover, Gerald Paxton, had been captured by a German raider in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, he was captured by the Germans and sent to a German prison camp. I thought it might happen to me, but I made it safely to Japan. <laughs> then I bought another vessel for China. <laughs> And then I boarded a train, the Trans-Siberian Express, all the way across Russia. Give me more train times. And I'd arrived in St. Petersburg. I must talk to Kerensky. I must keep the Russians in the war. So naturally, I presented myself to the British ambassador. Mr. Mom. Welcome to St. Petersburg. A pleasure to meet you. Such a distinguished novelist. Please have a seat. How can I help you, Mr. Mom? Mr. Ambassador, I must see General Kerensky. I need to talk to him about what will keep him in the war. What will keep the Russian army fighting on the Eastern Front. Is something wrong, Mr. Mom? No, I, 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 I have a stammer. I, I've had it since I was eight years old. Ah. I don't know why my government has so little faith in me. They have an ambassador in St. Petersburg. I've tried to talk to Kerensky. He won't talk. He does not have control of the situation. The man is in over his head. He has nothing to say to any of us. Why would you succeed where I have failed? I have a mandate from the British Prime Minister. I don't care about your mandate, Mr. Mom. I'm afraid there's no way of seeing Kerensky. You only fail like everyone else. Thank you so much for coming to see me. I do so admire your novels. Do keep writing. Good morning. I knew what I'd done wrong. I stammered. I should not have spoken. I, I should have just listened. I determined from then on not to do any talking, to reach out to people and talk as little as possible. I had made a bad impression. I spoke to the other British diplomats in St. Petersburg. They wouldn't help me. I, I spoke to French people. They wouldn't help me. The Americans, they wouldn't help me. And finally, I communicated. I don't know how, in broken Russian, with Russians directly. And one of them spoke to Kerensky. He'd heard of me. He knew I was a novelist and he agreed to meet with me. I went to see him at the Winter Palace where his office was. Come in, Mr. Mom. Boys, take a seat. Thank you for coming to see me, Mr. Rome. The situation now is desperate. The Russian army will stop fighting soon. They are convinced that the Germans are not going to advance anymore. The Russian people are full of despair and they doubt that the Germans are determined to conquer Russia. What you must do is go back to your prime minister, to prime minister, Yes, you must talk to the prime minister. You must tell him to approach the Germans with an armistice, to ask for a peace. The Germans, of course, will deny this. They will say no armistice, and then the Russian people will see. The Russian people will see that the Germans are fanatics, and then the war will resume, and Russia will stay in the war because they will see that the Germans are determined to conquer the world. You must talk to the Roy George, your prime minister, and convince him. Will you do that? You need uh, something to write with. Yes. Write it down, Mr. Mom, and take it to Roy George. Convince him. Convince him to ask for an armistice that the Germans will deny. Only that will convince the Russian people. I barely talked through the entire interview. I knew that all I needed was to write down his request and take that back to Lloyd George. <laughs> that night, I left for the Finland station. The same night, right after I 
left, Vladimir Lenin arrived at the Finland station. The communist revolution was only three days away. I took a train to Norway. <laughs> and then by boat across the North Sea through sub infested waters, the German U-boats, all of them looking for prey, like the ship I was on, giving some submarine sounds. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> I arrived in England and took a train to 10 Downing Street to meet with the Prime Minister Lloyd George. Mr. Marvin, I'm so pleased to meet you. Please do come in. Have a seat. I so admire your novels, and my wife is an enormous fan of your plays. What can I do to help you? I imagine it's about this whole Russia business. If Russia drops out of this war, we'll simply lose it. We must keep the Russians in the war. It's fantastic. Millions of British soldiers dying every day at the front. Pashendal, the Somme. The Russians I know are losing millions also. But it's a war of attrition. If they drop out, the Germans will overrun France, then England. How are we? You spoke to Kerensky, good man. And this is what he told you. Advice. He wants me to give the Germans a armistice, a peace treaty, which they will decline. And then the Russians will see that they're fanatics and stay in the war. My goodness, Mr. Bomb, you are a successful spy, aren't you? But the ambassador, and a million diplomats could not accomplish. Unfortunately, I cannot do this. It would make me look weak. I'm so sorry. Thank you so much for coming this evening, Mr. Mom. I look forward to your next novel and my wife, your next play. Good morning. I failed. I had gotten what the Russians wanted, but Lloyd George wasn't interested. I went back to the intelligence service. They were proud of me. I'd accomplished something that nobody had ever accomplished before. I'd actually gotten through to Kerensky. They wanted me to go to Romania and try the same thing with our Romanian allies, keep them in the war. I said, no, I had consumption. I'd been diagnosed. The same disease that had carried away my, my loving mother. I went into a sanitarium. To recover. So, a real spy story. A real spy story. It ends in failure, not romanticized, not glamorized. Like he tried, he tried, he tried, he succeeded, but it led to nothing. It was authentic spydom. And he wrote about all of his adventures in a book called Ashenden, which is the first great spy novel. And this novel inspired Fleming to create James Bond. It also inspired John Le Carre to create the realist spy novels, right? The spy will came in from the cold. The spy goes out into the cold and then comes back in from it. He inspired a whole generation of spy writing just by having his adventures and, 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 and writing about them. But he was a failure. He was knocked out of it. He was left it. I was knocked out of spying. Yeah, when I was nine years old, I was knocked out of it. Mostly because I was knocked out of Alan. <sighs> Alan. I thought Alan was my bud, you know? I thought he was on my side. You know, we would run around the town all the time. And as we were running around, I would make up stories and tell him things, right? I was a fabulous, okay? You know, I like to tell stories. And he seemed to be enjoying them all. So we'd be running around and I'd be telling him things like, you know, my father's an admiral in the US Navy. We have like five vacation houses, five. I wrote a book, it's on display at the local hobby shop. It's also in the Library of Congress. I wrote three books and I would just listen, you know, he seemed to be enjoying himself. He never said anything. And then one night I had him over for a sleepover and we were in our sleeping bags in the playroom and my older brother came in and Alan said, John Fisher told me that he had written five books. John Fisher told me that your father was an adult. He told my brother all my lies. He exposed me and my brother just sat there with those big thick glasses on. And every time Alan told me a lie, told him a lie, he'd go, he'd just shake his head. 
I just went on and on all night. Every sentence began with John Fisher said, John Fisher said, it was humiliating. I kept trying to just shut up. I finally covered his mouth. He thought I was joking. He pushed my hands away. God, what a creepo. To my brother's credit, when he was done listening to Alan, he just said, you're both so stupid. <laughs> well, that was it for Alan. He stayed the night, but then I kicked him out the next morning. It was crazy. Well, it cured me of making up stories. It also cured me of Alan. Fortunately, I never had a crush on him. Never. No, I didn't. I didn't have a crush on him. None. None whatsoever. I, no, no, he was boring. And his father was a dentist. That's the most boring profession of all time. I hate dentists. I didn't go see a dentist for like 10 years because of Alan. When I got root canal, I blamed it on Alan. Yeah. Where did mom's trauma about being gay come from? How did that come about? He was born only 20 years after Oscar Wilde. And when Oscar Wilde was persecuted by the British government, thrown in jail for being gay, and then basically exiled when he fled to France, mom was only 21 years old. He was there in London for all of it. Now Wilde, Oscar Wilde is a bit of an enigma. He is. A lot of people don't know some of these things about him. He considered converting to Catholicism, but his father said no. His father said, if you convert to Catholicism, I will cut you off. And he couldn't afford to live without money. He had a high lifestyle. He was a fancy dresser. So he didn't convert to Catholicism. He married a woman named Constance, whom he loved. He had two children whom he doted on. He was devoted to his children. What do people know about him? He was a great playwright. He wrote a great book, The Picture of Dorian Gray. He was great wit, but mostly they know him for being a very clever man who always knew what to say with just a, a twinge of perversity to it, right? He was always a little bit perverse. When he was crossing the border of a country, he was asked by the customs official if he had anything to declare. He said, I have nothing to declare except my genius. My advice to you is be yourself. Everybody else is already taken. Always, always, always forgive your enemies. Nothing annoys them more. I can resist everything except temptation. End of publicity. When I fell in love with Lord Alfred Douglas Boise, oh, <laughs> I was in heaven, a lover half my age, brilliant, beautiful. I told everyone I was so proud. And when I was libeled by his father, I preferred charges. I brought his father to court to sue him for libel. His father had written a note that was presented to me in my club. It said, for Oscar Wilde, posing as a somdomite. Somdomite? If you're going to insult people, you should at least spell correctly. I'm not a somdomite. I'm a sodomite. There is a difference. One doesn't exist. Also posing, I never posed as a sodomite. I wasn't posing, I just was. So I sued him for libel. My court appearance was spectacular. People loved it. The court laughed and laughed and laughed. It was more successful than most of my plays. And they were massive successes. And then the defense attorney rose, the one defending Lord Alfred Douglas's father. And he said, so you won't posing as a sodomite. I said, no, that's why we're here. That is libel. So if you weren't posing as one, that means you are. Of course, he tripped me up. He backed me into a corner. He basically forced me to admit my guilt. Of course, that was a fact. Doesn't mean it was the truth. My libel case was thrown out and then I was prosecuted for gross indecencies. The first case was the hung jury, but the second case found me guilty. 
of a crime that had not been enforced for 50 years against a man like myself. I was sentenced to two years, hard labor. The maximum sentence because they felt I made a clown of myself in court, that I had mocked the court. When the labor was too much for me, I was confined to my room. A 10 by 13 foot room, in which I was barely fed properly. It was cold, it was wet. I became sick, despondent, I was in despair. When I was on the verge of death, I begged for reading matter, for something to write with. The warden said no. He wanted to make an example of me and my kind. A new warden came in and decided if I didn't write, I'd probably die. So he gave me one page at a time. And when I filled that page, he took it away from me. He confiscated it. But that was the only thing that saved me. I wrote De Profundis, my letter to Lord Alfred. I served out my term when I was released. I couldn't stay in England. I traveled to France under assumed name. I was miserable in France. Which, of course, everybody enjoyed. They wanted me to be miserable, didn't they? It comforts people to see the great brought low. Napoleon Bonaparte, Paul Valen, Judy Garland, Marilyn Monroe. Oh yes, I've met both of them. I won't tell you where. I lived in a squalid hotel, forgotten by everybody. I was impoverished, begging for money, ill, sick, despondent. I lived in a squalid hotel too in Paris, just like wild. I was at the end of a big three month trip to Europe after I got out of college and I'd run out of money. My money didn't last long enough to include Paris. So when I got to Paris, I was like, out of money. But I got a hotel room for $5 a day. Yeah, that was great. I figured I can last one week in Paris and then I'll go to London where my daddy has, you know, he was associated with a bank and he could wire me some money. So this would be my lovely, you know, left bank experience in Paris. There I was in the Hotel Kouja. It was great. I was like a real bohemian. <laughs> Being a bohemian is really cold and wet. I was freezing all the time, my God. I didn't have a score to burn like La Boheme. I had nothing, I got sick. I hated it. Ugh, being a bohemian. During the day, I'd go outside and try and be a tourist in Paris, but I had barely any money, so all I could do was walk around. I mean, the city was beautiful, but it was cold and wet. It was the middle of the winter. I kept eating that food, you know, where they scrape it off of a big meat thing and put it in a pita. That's all I ate. I was just getting thicker and thicker. Found my week in Paris was over, and I got on a boat, a ferry boat, going to England. I just had to get to London, and I could get some money wired to me. Wilde's downfall had an incredible effect on Mourne. It really shook him up. It influenced his behavior from then on. He spent the rest of his life seeking freedom, a place where he could be free and gay. He traveled obsessively all over the world, first uh, to the continent and then to Asia, everywhere, trying to find a home, trying to find a place to be, trying to find a place where he couldn't be persecuted like Oscar Wilde had been. He and Haxton, Gerald Haxton, were both exiles. Haxton got out of jail, out of prison, out of a German prison camp at the end of the war, and they were reunited, but they couldn't go to England because Haxton had been exiled from England. He was an American with a record in England. They couldn't go back to England. So they traveled the world. Haxton had been deported, remember? He was caught in flagrante delecto, yeah. And I listened to this BBC podcast about uh, Somerset Mom, and it was so silly because they were talking about how he'd been arrested, you know, oh, oh, you know, in this hotel room. And they were like giggling, like, oh, isn't that naughty? Isn't that naughty? And then he was deported. Isn't that fun? There's nothing fun about being deported. I'll tell you. I was deported from England. Just like Haxton in 1985. I was on the ferry boats with no money. I thought I'd get to London. My daddy will wire me some money. So I arrived in England and I 
I went into immigration and I showed them my passport and they asked me if I had any money and I made a mistake. I told them I didn't. I had no money. Of course, they thought I was trying to sneak into the country to get a job, right? Take work away from the Englishman. So they started digging through my bag to find evidence. And they found my journal. They took my journal out. And right in front of me, they started reading my journal, my most personal thoughts. They were just leafing through, reading them. The two constables. And one of them would look at the other and point at something. And they'd both go, hmm. I've written in the journal about wanting to get to London and get some kind of a job. And there they were reading it, along with everything else, all my personal thoughts and feelings. I was so humiliated. I realized at that moment that I had no rights. I wasn't a British citizen. I was a nobody. And then they locked me in a little room. All it had in it was a chair. And while I was in there, they continued to read my journal. I was so humiliated. Somebody out there, read my journal. Go ahead, pick it up. Oh my God. Oh. I mean, I've been raised very sheltered. I've been protected my whole life. I always had privacy. I always had something I could rely on. And that was my dignity, my privacy. And I was seeing this room as they read through my journal. Okay, stop reading it. Stop reading it. Oh, finally they let me out. The constable was standing there and I said, you read my journal, you read, you read my personal thoughts. He said, yes, it wasn't very pleasant. What did that mean? It wasn't very pleasant to read or the contents weren't pleasant. I was like, how could you do that? He said, you're being deported. We're putting you on a ferry to France. Constables will take you down to the ferry. Good morning. Two constables, they didn't have something better to do. Two constables walked me down to the ferry. And then they let me on board. They made sure I got a seat. And they stood there staring at me. And only when they pulled the gangway away did they leave. They were the last ones off the boat. And they stared at the boat as if they thought I was going to jump overboard and swim ashore. I felt like a criminal. I felt like I had deserved it. And on top of that, what if the French didn't take me back? What if the French said, you can't come here either? What was I going to do? We just end up like swimming in the channel back and forth, hoping somebody on the beach wouldn't notice me? I was chugging back to France in this boat. There were two American college students with me, women. I started talking to them. They didn't even have passports. They'd lost their passports and the Brits hadn't let them in because they didn't have passports. And we're all going back to France wondering, like, what are we going to do? The ferry boat landed in Calais. I got off. I was so embarrassed. And what was I going to do? What was I going to do? And this French immigration officer met me right there at the boat and he asked for my passport. I handed it to him and he opened it up and it had a British entry stamp with an X through it. Qu'est-ce que c'est? Um, no, no, um, l'argent, no money, Britain. They, they threw me out. Exit. <laughs> Allez. He let me in. He let me into France. God loved the French. They didn't care. So I was walking away and I heard him yelling at the two women who I'd been talking to. I thought, well, you shouldn't yell at the women. And I said, hey, um, don't yell at them. Don't yell at them. He turned to me, ah, you want to stay? Go away. I said, okay, 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 okay. Quit while I'm ahead. So I walked into the Calais train station and it was empty. There were no more trains that night. There wouldn't be another one for another 12 hours in the morning. <sighs> what was I going to do? I was homeless. I didn't have any place to sleep. I didn't have any money. There's nobody in the downstairs, no place to sit, nothing. I went upstairs to the second floor. I couldn't believe it. I looked around and the entire second floor was full of homeless people sleeping. Okay, no, we're not supposed to identify them as homeless. That's identifying them with their condition. 
people living with homelessness everywhere on the second floor of this train station asleep. I joined them. I went over and I set down my backpack and sat between these two guys. They looked at me and they said, where are you going? I don't know. I just got thrown out of Britain. I didn't have any money. <laughs> I said, what should I do? Go to Paris. There's opportunities in Paris. You can get the money in Paris. Opportunities? What was I going to do in Paris? What were they suggesting? I said, I can't even get to Paris. You know, I, I mean, I don't have any money for a train. It doesn't matter. No, they don't check. They rarely check the train tickets. If they do, just hide in the bathroom. I thought, okay. They were giving me advice. I thought, how nice. And so I spread out. I didn't have anything to steal. <laughs> My passport obviously wasn't any good. It wasn't going to help me. And I lay there and I was a callow youth. So I asked them, why are you guys in the street? Why are you living this way? <sighs> what a question. But they were kind enough to answer. Oh, we're from Ireland. And if we stayed in Ireland, we just drink. It's a way of not drinking. I kind of thought, well, they're probably still drinking, but not as much. And also, if they stayed in Ireland, they'd probably just be labeled the town drunks, right? In this way, they were seeing the world in their own way. They asked me, could you tell us, do you speak enough French to tell us how to ask for food in French? And I said, I know, but I could probably figure something out. And they said, all right, write it down. That'd be a big help. We talked about all kinds of things. They were so nice to me. As the night went on, we all fell asleep. It was the first time I'd relaxed in like 48 hours. I don't know. I slept so soundly in that train station with all those people. I got up before anybody else. It was like 5.30 in the morning. I had to catch that first train. But then I remembered that they'd asked me to tell them how to ask for food in French. So I wrote out in this horrible French, this phrase on two pieces of paper and left them with them, next to them. My Irish friends who got me through the night. And I got on the train, I had confidence. They told me it wasn't gonna be a problem. And the train made it all the way to Paris without a conductor coming by. They were right. And just as it was entering Paris, a conductor showed up and I couldn't get to the bathroom. So I stood up. He asked me what to get, to get. And I said, uh, and I pulled out an old ticket an expired one. I said, here. He said, mm. I said, mm. and we, we did that for a while. Mm, 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 mm. And finally said, ah, and he let me go. God loved the French. So I got back to Paris, but I was stateless. I was homeless. I was shelterless, alone. I was precarious. Americans have such a sense of entitlement and it was stripped away. I didn't belong anywhere. I felt like an immigrant crossing the border just trying to get work. And why not? I wasn't willing to take a job from a Brit. They probably wouldn't want the jobs I was interested in. I think about that when people come to this country, how I must feel to end up in jail or thrown back, humiliated all along the way. That's what Wilde was after he was exposed when he ended up in France, alone down and out in Paris. You know, there have been many plays that have been written about Wilde and his persecution and what happened after he went back to France. It's very interesting because none of these plays talk about that feeling of statelessness, aloneness, exile. They just don't talk about it. There was a play in the 90s called The Three Trials of Oscar Wilde. And what's amazing to me is that a lot of people love Wilde, but they're always rediscovering that he was persecuted as a homosexual. I was like, that was the first thing I knew about him. But a lot of people just enjoy the plays and they're like, oh, really? He was persecuted as a homosexual? I'm like, duh. This play was really interesting because it was just about his trials. That's all it covered were his trials. And the actors kept holding up books, scholarly books, and then quoting from them. They'd hold them up and they'd quote from the book about the trial. But he didn't talk about the humiliation the statelessness he felt going through it all. I mean, Oscar Wilde was a character on stage, but he never got to talk about it. We never saw that, that degradation that was such a part of this experience for him. There was another play by the great playwright David Hare called The Judas Kiss. And it was all about wild times in Paris with Boise, with, um, with Lord Alfred Douglas. 
Bozzi joined him in Paris. But there was still none of that statelessness, the emptiness, the despair. There was some um, Divergence and Delights, which was a play, a one-man play that Vincent Price used to tour in all over the country, playing Oscar Wilde in Paris. But he never talked about that horror, the horror of not belonging. Probably the best entertainment about Wilde is Patient, the operetta by Gilbert and Sullivan. That's about the aesthete movement. And it's basically a play about Oscar Wilde, but it was before anything had happened to him, before he'd been persecuted. And he was such a famous aesthete that when it was sent to America, when Gilbert and Sullivan sent patients to America, they sent Oscar Wilde with it to give lectures. And that's how he became famous, traveling around America, giving lectures to introduce people to the aesthetes, to the high liver, to the grand men like Oscar Wilde that the operetta was about. But like I said, it didn't cover that period. Of course, my statelessness didn't last long. I went to a fancy Parisian hotel. I uh, picked up a phone. I made a quick call to my daddy and he sent me money. Yeah. So I had a bailout, Brian, right? I wasn't like an immigrant or Oscar Wilde. Just a upper middle class kid with a big parachute. Yeah. Oscar Wilde was despondent. He became grotesque. He was desperate. What else is he famous for? The plays. He's famous for the plays. Okay, okay. Now this is where I'm gonna get radical. This is where people aren't gonna agree with me. The plays work and they don't work. They're difficult. Okay, so there's six major plays. One of them wasn't produced, Vera. And then there's Salome, which is like, okay, you should really just, yeah, just, just read the uh, New Testament. It's much more interesting. The New Testament actually is more interesting in this way. Then there are four plays that are often performed. Lady Windermere's Fan, which is all about, you know, a brazen woman who shows up society. But I can't, you know, it's like, what else is about? I mean, it's not that exciting a play. The subject's been covered better other places. There's an ideal husband, which people are rediscovering about every 20 years. And that's about, you know, truth and honesty in marriage. Well, Ibsen nailed that with Doll's House. It doesn't, this play adds nothing to that whole discourse. Then there's A Woman of No Importance, which is about, you know, it's called his feminist play. It's not feminist. It's all these guys talking about stuff. The women get to say very little. And finally, there's the importance of being earnest, which is considered his masterpiece. Now, okay, it is a masterful play, but what is it famous for? It's, for? it's famous for the perversity of his speech, the twisting language, the language that always upends stuff. Now, most of the characters don't really talk that way. A few of them do, but the one who is uncontestably a game changer in terms of British dialogue is Lady Augusta Blacknell, right? Everything she says is perverse. I don't mean perverted, I mean twisted, right? This is what she has to say about courtship and engagements. To speak frankly, I'm not in favor of long engagements. They give people the opportunity of finding out each other's character before marriage, which I think is never advisable. She always twists things like that. She's very clever that way because she's like an ultra conservative. She's an old fussy fussy, but she says things so correctly. You almost begin to subscribe to what she's saying. And for that, Oscar Wilde gets full marks. The rest of the canon, I often wonder about. His reputation sort of carries it along, but is it as clever? Is it as important as people say it is? Lady Bracknell, I will give him that. The life, the life is important. His life, his life is in the seat, and then his downfall as a, as a gay man, persecuted as a gay man. And one of the most moving experiences you can have is to go to the, the cemetery of Père Lachaise in Paris. And everybody goes there to see the grave of Jim Morrison, right? And the grave of Jim Morrison, don't bother. I mean, it's behind two other graves and it's like really small and there's nothing there. It's like, the, there's like this old album cover that's been out in the rain for 20 years. It's like nothing, but nearby is the tomb the massive tomb of Oscar Wilde, created by the great sculptor, Jacob Epstein. It is magnificent, but the best part about it, the best part about it is something that takes your breath away when you see it. So there's the tomb. And if you look down low, it's covered with kisses. 
So people put lipstick on and they go and they kiss the tomb. There's even a sign saying, don't kiss the tomb, don't kiss the tomb. They cover it with kisses. And then with lipstick, they write on it. They write on it things like, I love you, Oscar Wilde. Je t'aime, Oscar Wilde. It is so moving. But the thing that really got me, the thing that just killed me is I was there with Michael, my husband, and I read, I read on it. I never enjoyed reading until I read the picture of Dorian Gray. Thank you. Thank you, Oscar Wilde. Another one said, I'm Irish and I hate the Irish. Oscar Wilde actually made me proud of being Irish. He was Irish, he was an Irish nationalist. I'd forgotten that about him. And somebody was actually made proud and people love to kiss the grave. It's amazing. Now, is he a saint? Is he Saint Oscar? Is he the man who was martyred for homosexuality? Okay, the closest he got to ever really talking about that was in a work called De Profundis, which was the letter they wrote to Bosey, to Lord Alfred Douglas from prison. It really isn't a pro-gay letter. As a matter of fact, he spends the whole letter castigating uh, Lord Alfred for getting him into trouble. And the second half of it, he turns himself into a martyr along the lines of Jesus Christ. He says he's a martyr, but not to gay them, not to homosexuality, just to trials, to tribulation. He wasn't a gay martyr. He didn't believe in it. He did not embrace it as a separate sexuality. And then there's his novel, A Picture of Dorian Gray, which is full of sexual innuendo. It's a very, very gay book. I love this book. It is a page turner. It is so compelling, this book. It is so exciting. It is just naughty, this book. I was so excited by this book that I actually put it on stage. I did my own stage adaptation of it, right? And the critics actually loved what we did with it, right? There are only a few actors on stage, like six or seven of us, but there were no props, nothing. There were just four chairs and a big black empty stage. And it was full of all sorts of action. Like we played the little bees. Bzz, bzz, buzz for me, buzz for me. Bzz, bzz, bzz. We played the little birds. <laughs> yeah, make the bird sounds. We caressed each other's faces sexually. There was a lot of sex and naughtiness and nudity in it. And the critics actually liked that about it. The big thing, the big scene is when Dorian Gray is confronted by the brother of a woman he drove to suicide. Now you remember the story. He gets this artist to do a painting of him, right? And then he puts the painting in the attic and the painting gets old and corrupt and evil looking as he stays exactly the same age and pure. So he does all these really nasty things, but he doesn't have to take credit for it. He doesn't have to age. The painting will do all the nasty stuff for him. And the painting gets more and more decrepit and ugly and grotesque. It's hideous, but he is always the same. He never gets older. And so when he's confronted by this brother of this girl that he drove to suicide, this guy chases him across London and we filled the stage with smoke and we had this big chase scene where they kept running across the stage, chasing each other. And then they'd run through the dressing room to get back to the other side of the stage. And then they'd run across the stage and chase each other. And I swear to God, I was channeling all those days of being a spy with Alan Dolch and running through my town, running, running, running through the mist and the mist billowed. It was so cool, you could barely see them. All you could see was this billowing mist. And like I said, the critics were really into what I did with the production. They liked it, but they didn't go for the story. And when you think about it, the story isn't really all that compelling a story. It's kind of an adolescence fantasy that you don't want to get old. You don't want to have experiences written onto your face. You just want to stay the same age and the painting gets old. Is that really what adults think? Is that really the subject of a three hour play? And we could feel it. The audience wasn't with us. Night after night, they loved all the action and creativity, but the story itself, they just weren't engaged. At the very end, we brought on the only prop we brought on in the whole show, the actual picture of Dorian Gray. And by then he died, right? He was dead on stage and all the hideousness went into his face. And there he was, pure and young in the picture once again, because the body had assumed all the hideousness in death. 
the picture of Dorian Gray. People think the title is the portrait of Dorian Gray. No, it's a picture. Significant difference. It was the only prop in the show. I love this painting. The artist was inspired by his sometimes friend, James McNeil Whistler. Yeah, Kristen Uren did that painting. Gorgeous. She still has it. But the play didn't work. And every night we had to perform this three hour play that didn't work. But it was a great cast, you know? And on Saturdays, after a week of performing this long play, which just wasn't always connecting with the audience, the cast started bringing food and drink and they'd spread all this stuff out on the stage. And we'd have a big party every week. It was really quite magical. And I started bringing, you know, nice liquor. I'm not a drinker, but I thought they should know what nice liquor, they were drinking like this rat gut stuff. And it's just like, I was like, you don't have to drink that. That's swill, it's gonna destroy your tummy. You can have like a, you know, exploding bottom syndrome. It's gonna be terrible. Yeah. So I brought them this nice liquor and every Saturday night we had a party. So it was actually a wonderful experience. And when it was over, I decided it was time to reward myself. So Michael and I, my husband, we took a big trip to China and Japan. And I realized in that moment that I was more like mom than I was like wild. In other words, wild was all about art, the magic of art. Art is dominant. But mom believed in the world, in adventures and exploration. And art means nothing compared to the world. That's what I realized. Now, mom's life was always difficult. He was married to Siri, right? Now, his wife kind of tricked him into marrying her. She was a divorcee, and she got pregnant. And uh, that's his interpretation. Decide what you want. But he did the honorable thing, and he married her. But he always felt like he was kind of tricked. And he didn't want to be with her. He wanted to be with Gerald Haxton, his boyfriend, right? But they couldn't be in London. So he set his wife and his daughter, Liza, up in London in a nice house. And he and Gerald lived all over the world. They traveled, right? Because they couldn't go to England. He'd been deported from England. He could not do that. So they traveled everywhere. To every corner of the world, they went to Malay, to China, to Japan, to India. They cruised the oceans. And Gerald was incredibly sociable. He could talk to anybody. He was cool, right? He was from San Francisco, right? He could walk into a bar into a restaurant, into a hotel, and strike up a conversation with anybody. And that was perfect for mom because then all mom had to do was listen. He didn't want to talk. He had that horrible stammer. So he could just sit there and listen and absorb. And that's where he got his stories from, just listening and absorbing. And that's where all of his great stories came from. Ray, also known as Sadie Thompson, The Razor's Edge, The Moon and Sixpence, the Narrow Corner, all of those short stories. And those short stories hold up. They are amazing. I've been reading those short stories to Michael, my husband, for years. I've read Michael aloud. All those stories and all the novels, they're magnificent because they're real. With Wild, you feel like you're inhabiting sort of this fantasy universe, this alternative universe of witty, clever people, but they don't seem real. They're almost like science fiction. In the case of Portrait of Dorian Gray, they actually are science fiction. But in the case of mom, they're down to earth. And they're about what happens when the mask that we all fall, wear falls away. And we're exposed as licentious, murderers, schemers, adulterers, evil people. That's what mom saw. That even lurking beneath the calmest mask could be great villainy, desire, passion. Most of his stories were about the disillusion of the British Empire. Yeah about all the middle-class people who ran the empire and how it was dissolving because, because they were corrupt. A lesson to all of us in the United States, right? As our empire dissolves. Yeah, there's a lot in there that we could learn from. And these stories and his life with Gerald gave him sanctuary. Sanctuary from the persecution that had brought down wild. It gave them freedom. I found my freedom with Michael, my husband. We um, emerged as a couple during AIDS, but it was always a fact in our lives. We always knew that we had to be safe, right? Because it was always a fact and we were devoted to each other and it set us apart. And there were many people we knew when we were first coming out who didn't want to have anything to do with us. Members of the gay community who 
because we didn't have AIDS, because we hadn't really lost anybody to AIDS that was close to us, felt like we weren't really gay. We were just dedicated to each other, married. Marriages were straight people. So we didn't find any community in that community, but we found community in each other. That's what brought us together. It gave us freedom and bicycle. Yes, we found it in bicycle. See, we didn't want to own anything. We didn't want the responsibility of cars and houses. So we rode bikes. That's how we got around. The freedom of a bike. You see, a bike can be stolen, but what does it matter? You just buy another one. I bought this for $210 on Craigslist during COVID. I've had seven bikes stolen, but it's not that big a tragedy. Also, you don't have to insure a bike and you can ride a bike drunk. Nobody cares if you ride bikes drunk. They're not like cars. It's incredible freedom. You don't have to worry about parking, insurance, anything. You're just a bike rider. So what happened to everybody? Huh? Well, what happened to Oscar Wilde? He died at 46. He just wasted away. I think he basically committed suicide. He was sick, despondent, alone, no money. And he just committed suicide. Suicide by ailment. And when he was on his deathbed, he was accepted into the Catholic Church. His dream. He was confessed and absolved, absolved of his sins, one of which was homosexuality. He truly wasn't a gay martyr. What happened to Alan? Well, Alan and his brothers started a tech firm. Yeah. And my best friend in college went to work for them. Yeah. And it was a job as a production manager. And they told him, well, um, you know, we're not going to pay you much. But in five years, when we go public, we'll make you a partner, and then you're going to be able to cash out. And as that date approached, my friend was very excited because he was going to be a partner in Alan's brother's firm. He's going to be one of them, right? The day before they went public, they fired him, my friend. So obviously, they hadn't learned the lesson about telling the truth. And mom? Mom went on to become the best-selling, most filmed, most televised author of the 20th century. He had a phenomenal success. And he never came out of the closet. He never openly expressed himself as gay. And he was never caught. And people loved him. They thought he wrote brilliantly for everybody. Women, straight men, everybody. A lot of people said he was a misogynist. But women loved playing his roles in movies and on stage because they were drama. They were high drama. And he became an incredibly successful writer. Haxton died, his boyfriend, in 1944. And mom, what did he do during World War II? He became a spy. He came to the United States. He lectured and he did everything he could to bring the United States into the war on the side of Great Britain. So he went on spying, went on adventuring. With the loss of Haxton, he was very sad. He had lost the love of his life. But he found a new Mr. Mom in a man named Alan Searle. Now, Alan Searle was with him until his death. Very controversial figure because, of course, he wanted all of Mom's money. So he got in a big fight with Mom's family, right? With the wife and the daughter, right? Ugly, ugly, ugly fight. But the fight led to a lot of good biographies because everybody talked to all the biographers because they wanted their story to end up in the biographies, right? So that's how we got a lot of extra information. Very good. A fight's good for biographies. He was the former lover of Witten Strachey. Yeah, Witten Strachey, author of Eminent Victorians, right? Witten Strachey referred to Alan Searle as his Bronzino boy. You know Bronzino, that Renaissance painter? He painted those beautiful men with those beautiful heads and then those huge cod pieces. They're obscene. And the way they're hung in museums, the cod pieces right at your face. I can't believe somebody got away with that. That was Alan Searle. Beautiful head, and then a huge cod piece. It was interesting, in preparing this piece, I looked at the plaques on Castro Street. You see them as you walk up Castro Street? Alan Turing, James Baldwin, Oscar Wilde, a gay saint. Really? I don't think so. And no Somerset mom. 
No, no, coward. These are my gay saints. The guys who figured it out, who got the gay stuff out there subtly. You know, mom was an incredibly successful playwright. If you read the plays correctly, it's a matter of translation. You just translate the plays and you begin to see gay stories. I think that's gay Satan, carrying it forward and then leaving behind this great biography, a life led abroad safely with your husband. That's why when I open up a book about mom, a biography, or one about Noel Coward, who lived much the same way, I see a mirror, a mirror of my own life, a mirror where I can see myself surviving somehow, not being defeated by persecution or judgment. That's what I think the books about mom give us. They give us what I think is truly inspirational gay story, not a story of despair, loss of hope, suicide, destruction. I mean, God bless Oscar Wilde. He was brilliant. He was amazing, eminently quotable, forever and ever. He gave us so much, but mom, mom really is a life to inspire. Thank you so much for joining me. This has been Wild and Mom, yay! To my wonderful studio audience, yay! To everybody out there who provides some sound for us, Thank you so much. This has been the Essential Services Project, a Sassy Mouse production. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I just wanted to open up for a little post-show discussion with our studio audience. Do you have anything to offer to our adventure tonight? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, exalted. Yeah. Uh, nobody ever gets to find out what people think of them after they're gone. Yeah. You know, you hear about these histories and personality. Right. And then you kind of wish that they got to see it. I'll say that about him. I think if he found out that he was revered by gay people, he would have embraced homosexuality. He'd be like, yeah, I'll take that. Why not? Yeah, he was the most arrogant person. Oh, yeah. He didn't need to be nationless because he was his own. That's a very good point. He was. He didn't need it. He just needed himself. Yeah. I think you're right, though. I think he'd be very proud to have a plaque on Castro Street. I'm not sure he'd fully understand it at first, but he'd be very happy well, to see his image. Yes! It's like, oh my God, he'd probably be the gayest person of all time. He'd probably embrace all of it. Yeah. Yeah, I was always struck by how people don't know about him being gay. They know his plays, they love his plays, but so many people, it's like every 20 years, people have to be told again what he went through. It's like the suppression of gay lives. Yeah. Yeah. I'm guilty too, but people don't read that much. So they learn over and over again. Well, that's interesting. But it's good for playwrights. They get to tell old stories over and over again, right? It's like, oh, I can just tell that story. I'm like, mm, it's been told. Yeah, but 20 years ago, nobody remembers that, right? I'm always amazed by that. It's like, oh, that story's come back. That's fun. Anything else? Sitcoms do that Oh, my God. Sitcoms don't even wait 20 years. Yeah, they just wait two years. Thank you so much for joining us. I am off to New York City soon. So the next time I broadcast, we'll be live from New York. So check it out. We'll be sending out, what's that? Yes, exactly. That's my inspiration. Saturday night, gay, gay, Thursday night live. Thursday night, gay live. So check us out. We'll be back. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to our studio audience. Thank you to Stephanie doing such wonderful camera work and voices tonight. And thank you, audience. Yay! And you can end it.